Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're glad to have you with us tonight. We have been working our way through the book of Exodus and tonight we are ready to go through Exodus chapter 35. And so we want to invite you to be finding a Bible of your own and turning with us to Exodus chapter 35. We'll be there in just a few moments. As always, as we explain, if you have any questions or concerns about tonight's class, if there's anything that we need to be praying about, if there's some way that we can serve you as God's family here in Madison, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also call or send a text to 608-224-0274. But as I said, tonight we are back to the book of Exodus. God's people are now free from their slavery in Egypt. They are getting ready to leave Mount Sinai. But before they do, they're going to need some review of the law. God will hit some of the highlights and uh, get the tabernacle built and pretty much getting the tabernacle built is where we start out tonight as they kind of get started on that process so they have the plans and now they're going to start assembling those materials so let's jump right into it tonight with the first paragraph in exodus 35 this is exodus chapter 35 verses 1 through 9 exodus 35 verses 1 through 9 then moses assembled all the congregation of the sons of israel and said to them these are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do. For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a holy day, a Sabbath of complete rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall not kindle a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. Moses spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded, saying, Take from among you a contribution to the Lord, whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it as the Lord's contribution, gold, silver, and bronze, and blue, purple, and scarlet material, fine linen, goat's hair, and ram skins dyed red, and porpoise skins, and acacia wood, and oil for lighting, and spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones, and setting stones for the ephod, and for the breast piece. So now that we've made it through the whole golden calf incident, that's been several weeks now until we finally got over that, uh, God now gives yet another reminder to keep the Sabbath day. And it seems like we've had several of these scattered throughout the book of Exodus. In fact, the Sabbath was mentioned a few chapters even before the Ten Commandments were given. So here again, Again, we have another reminder to rest on the seventh day but as always let's notice that the command to rest does not start with the command to rest but the command to rest actually starts with a command to work and I think we've noted that a few times over the past several months as we've worked through this so for six days work may be done but everybody has to rest on the seventh day and this is to be a holy day set apart for honoring the Lord Several years ago, I remember listening in on a conversation about whether you could mow your grass on a Sunday afternoon between the morning service and the evening service. And uh, we haven't had that problem here in Madison, at least since I've been here. We've never had a regular evening service. Uh, but as I remember it, somebody was under the impression that Sunday was the Christian Sabbath. And so those Sabbath rules that used to apply to the seventh day now apply to the first day of the week. And so therefore today, uh, we are not allowed to do any work on Sunday. And that was the, uh, the argument that I overheard being made. This was many years ago, actually. Um, but the Sunday is not the Christian Sabbath. Uh, there are some similarities, but it is certainly not completely parallel. So we are not forbidden from working on a Sunday, for example. Uh, we do have an obligation to come together as God's people and worship on the first day of every week and to encourage each other. That's a big part of it. And to receive encouragement ourselves. We sing, we pray, we partake of the Lord's Supper, and so on. Uh, but that does not mean that it is a sin to do any physical labor on a Sunday. So if I go home after worship on a Sunday and mow the grass, uh, I'm not violating God's law these days. There's nothing in there about that. So we're not under the law of Moses today. Gentiles have never been bound by the law of Moses. Uh, we can learn from that law. There are certainly some great lessons we can learn from the law of Moses. But keeping the Sabbath is uh, not something that any of us alive today have ever been commanded to do. So just want to bring that up since that still is every once in a while something we might hear. Uh, but nevertheless, in this passage, we've got the added reminder they are not even to kindle a fire in their homes on the Sabbath day. So no work, no fires. 
And I don't remember that in all of the Sabbath commandments. I don't know if this is a new one or if this is a reminder that just isn't repeated everywhere. But uh, no work, no fires on the seventh day of the week. And that'd be a pretty visual reminder, wouldn't it? You'd be sitting around your house cold, uh, depending on the climate they were in or the time of year. So now that God has reaffirmed his love for these people after the golden calf incident, now that he's given them yet another reminder about the Sabbath day, it's now time to get to work. So they've got a lot to do. And certainly a big part of the law of Moses was the worship that would take place in the tabernacle. However, they don't yet have a tabernacle, do they? They have the instructions for the tabernacle. So that's what we're going to be looking at in the last few chapters of Exodus, the actual construction of this tent or tabernacle. And notice the process starts here with a command from God to take up a free will offering. And that right there sounds a little bit like a, kind of like an oxymoron, or a, it doesn't make sense, like a logical impossibility, doesn't it? God gives a command to take up a free will offering. And we're going to have a similar conflict under the new law. I'm thinking of what Paul said regarding the weekly collection in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 8, when he said, I am not speaking this as a command, but as proving through the earnestness of others than since the sincerity of your love also. So I know today it's very easy for us to think about giving as a command. And I know on the first day of the week, sometimes we might mention, you know, as we've been commanded, we are taking up a collection. And, and in a sense, that's true. In a sense, giving has been commanded. And yet in another sense, I just want us to note that Paul specifically says in that verse that he is not commanding this. I mean, he outright says that straight up in the Word of God. I, I am not giving this as a command. And so I think we understand that, in a sense, it is something that we need to do. It has been commanded. Uh, but in another sense, this is not something that we are to feel obligated to do. I don't know if that's the best way of putting it. But maybe rather the emphasis here is that we are to look on our giving as a privilege, uh, not as a, a tax that has been leveled upon us. And so the offering itself is to be a free will offering. And that's what we see in the New Covenant, but we also see it here tonight in Exodus 35 under the Law of Moses. So there's a sense in which God is certainly commanding the people give, but that offering is to be, in fact, a free will offering. So whoever has a willing heart is to step up and give. So the way I see this today, our giving that we do to God today is not to be considered a tax. A tax is mandatory, isn't it? And the amount of our tax is not optional. There's no negotiation with the IRS over this, generally speaking. Uh, some of you know that we pay our taxes on a quarterly basis. As a minister, um, I'm an employee of the church for income tax purposes, but I'm self-employed when it comes to the uh, various taxes related to uh, Social Security. So it's a little bit complicated being a dual status employee, non-employee like that. Right now we've submitted um, our end of the paperwork to our tax preparer. And uh, so we are now anxiously awaiting the ax to fall. We're kind of waiting for the bad news. So at this moment, I don't know exactly what we're gonna owe Uncle Sam in two weeks. So I don't know what that check's gonna be when I mail that in on April 15th. Uh, in the same way, I also don't know what our quarterly payments are going to be for the rest of this year and into the next. Uh, we're about to find out. I think it's roughly 15% of our income that we've got to write that check out for uh, four times a year. But it's complicated, and I just want to emphasize here that it's mandatory. This is something I have to do. We have to pay income taxes. So the check that I send to the federal government in a couple weeks is not going to be a free will offering, is it? Um, I'm happy to be a citizen. I'm willing to pay what's owed, uh, but it is owed. And so I'm not going to pay any more than I need to. Well, our giving to the Lord is not like that at all. Um, when we give to the Lord, we give as we've been prospered. And that's about the only guidance that we have. We are to give with liberality, so we are to be generous in our giving. Uh, it is a percentage. Um, all of us give a percentage, but we aren't told what that percentage needs to be. That's up to us. We are to give willingly. We are to give cheerfully. We are to give freely. But the actual amount, the actual percentage is not specified under the new covenant. Now, later on in the Law of Moses, they will have... Uh, percentages and certain things that they have to give, but this is not that. This is a free will offering. So in a similar way, God is commanding these people give freely. There's no such thing as cash in those days. 
And so they are to give what's needed. Um, the call goes out for supplies. To build this building and to do the things, they're going to need gold and silver and bronze and fabric and animal skins and wood and oil for the lamps as well as spices for the anointing oil and various stones for the breastplates that would be made for the priests to wear. So they need materials. That's the first thing that's addressed here. But I also want us to notice that they need labor as well. So let's continue tonight with Exodus chapter 35, verses 10 through 19. Exodus 35, 10 through 19. Let every skillful man among you come and make all that the Lord has commanded. The tabernacle, its tent and its covering, its hooks and its boards, its bars, its pillars and its sockets, the ark and its poles, the mercy seat and the curtain of the screen, the table and its poles and all its utensils and the bread of the presence, the lampstand also for the light and its utensils and its lamps and the oil for the light, and the altar of incense and its poles and the anointing oil and the fragrant incense and the screen for the doorway at the entrance of the tabernacle. The altar of burnt offering with its bronze grating, its poles and all its utensils, the basin and its stand, the hangings of the court, its pillars and its sockets, and the screen for the gate of the court, the pegs of the tabernacle and the pegs of the court and their cords, the woven garments for ministering in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons to minister as priests. So notice in this passage, in addition to materials, they also need labor to build the tabernacle, skilled labor. And so God puts out a call for those who are skilled in various trades. So he's looking for those who know how to construct a tent. They'll be working with the covering over it, as well as the hooks and the boards and the bars and the pillars and the sockets. And they'll also be making the ark, which is a gold covered box and the table and the lampstand and the altar and the screen and the altar with its grates and tools, and they'll be making hangings for the courtyard and its screen. And on top of all of this, they'll also be making the clothing for the priest. And some of those garments involved chain mail, if I remember correctly. And so it's a, a vast variety of skills that are involved here, from sewing to woodworking to metal crafting, and, and all kinds of amazing things need to be done. And so there's some serious skill involved here, isn't there? And most of what's required takes place behind the scenes. I also want us to notice this. In other words, these people that are being called upon here, they're not speaking publicly. They're not leading in worship. They're not standing up before the people doing some show. But these are the people who get it done. And I appreciate this. This paragraph is so important. Worship would not happen without the people in this paragraph doing what they've been called upon to do. Without these people, there would be no Ark of the Covenant. There would be no tabernacle. There would be no furniture. There would be no utensils. The priest would be running around without anything to wear. And so this paragraph then is incredibly important. I know it's very easy to overlook that. And I would say just as it's also easy to overlook some of those physical things that need to be done when we come together as a congregation today. We don't have a tabernacle specified for us today, uh, but in Madison we've chosen to purchase a property with a building on it that we come together and we meet in this building, and it needs to be a, a safe place to assemble. Um, we need to have bathrooms, we need to have a source of water, we need to have a roof over our heads, we need the doors to work, we need the windows to be clean, we need the railing out front to be functional, and on and on and on, and, and those take some serious skills, it also takes financing, so I'm just noticing some parallels between back then and today. Uh, not everything that we do today as a church involves uh, praying publicly, uh, but a lot of what we do today involves some serious behind-the-scenes work, changing the furnace filters and repairing the water heater and making sure the baptistry is functional, and on and on and on. So they had similar concerns back then. Well, let's continue with Exodus 35, verses 20 through 29, the next paragraph. Exodus 35, 20 through 29. Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel departed from Moses' presence. Everyone whose heart stirred him and everyone whose spirit moved him came and brought the Lord's contribution for the work of the tent of meeting and for all its service and for the holy garments. Then all whose hearts moved them, both men and women, came and brought brooches and earrings and signet rings and bracelets, all articles of gold 
So did every man who presented an offering of gold to the Lord, every man who had in his possession blue and purple and scarlet material, and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and porpoise skins brought them. Everyone who could make a contribution of silver and bronze brought the Lord's contribution. And every man who had in his possession acacia wood for any work of the service brought it. All the skilled women spun with their hands and brought what they had spun in blue and purple and scarlet material and in fine linen. All the women whose hearts stirred with uh, skill spun the goat's hair. The rulers brought the onyx stones and the stones for setting for the ephod and for the breastpiece and the spice and the oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. The Israelites, all the men and women whose heart moved them to bring material for all the work which the Lord had commanded through Moses to be done, brought a free will offering to the Lord. We find here that the people take this to heart, don't they? So Moses has this assembly. He puts out the call for materials and the call for help. And notice there at the beginning, they departed. They left. And so they went back to their tents. They had time to think this over. Moses calls for a free will contribution, and they come through in a big way, don't they? They come through with all kinds of jewelry, um, brooches, earrings, signet rings, bracelets, fabric, animal skin, silver, bronze, wood. If somebody had the ability to give something that was needed for this project, they gave it. And not only did they give, but I also want us to notice that they get to work. The women start spinning and weaving. The jewelers start jeweling. The oilers start oiling. Men and women alike, if anybody had a, an item or a skill, uh, they would put both to use in the Lord's service in the construction of the tabernacle. Well, let's close tonight with the last paragraph, Exodus 35, verses 30 through 35. Exodus 35, 30 through 35. Then Moses said to the sons of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and in knowledge and in all craftsmanship, to make designs for working in gold and in silver and in bronze and in the cutting of stones for setting and in the carving of wood so as to perform in every inventive work. He also has put in his heart to teach both he and Oholiab, the son of Ashamach of the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with skill to perform every work of an engraver and of a designer and of an embroiderer in blue and in purple and in scarlet material and in fine linen and of a weaver as performers of every work and makers of design designs. So just briefly in this last paragraph, we find God has called certain men to some special roles here. Um, you know, sometimes people may have a kind of a natural talent or a skill, maybe an interest in doing something that they kind of get better at over time and they do it and they learn by experience. And this may be part of it, but it looks here like God blesses these men with a miraculous dose of wisdom and understanding and skill in some of these areas. You know, we think of God inspiring the Bible by communicating what he wanted to have written. And so maybe in some similar way, God has a plan for the tabernacle. God has this picture in his mind of the way it's going to look, for the way it would function. And God apparently somehow beamed this into the minds of certain men. And these men, it seems, become leaders of this project. And these men were given even the ability to teach others. So they were given skill, not only in building and constructing and engraving and jewelry and all of this, but they were also given the ability to pass this along. So this was a, a huge project, and God gave them the knowledge and also the skill to get it done. I wonder whether any of you guys have seen what happens in a sewing factory. Have you ever seen a sewing factory? Um, you might know that I love seeing how things are made, and so I love factory tours. I've toured the GM plant when it was open down in Janesville uh, probably up close to a dozen times. Whenever we had a guest speaker come into the church, we'd take them to the GM plant and uh, show them around, take the tour. Uh, I've toured the Subaru plant over in Indiana where I think, uh, I think my old Outback was made there. A uh, beautiful factory there in Lafayette, Indiana. I've toured the factory down in Janesville where they restore the process for making uh, Janesville wagons and carts. And uh, we toured a whistle factory on the north side of Columbus, Ohio a year or two ago. An interesting factory there, just looking around in there a little bit. 
Um, I would love to tour the Airstream factory. Um, there is no way I don't think I could ever afford a, an Airstream trailer, but uh, there's a factory there that offers tours. I'd love to do that on a future trip. Uh, the Wilson Football Factory over in Ohio offers factory tours. The last time I was there, they were closed for tours. I think uh, retooling the plant, so couldn't do it. But uh, one of the most interesting tours that we've been on was of the uh, Stormy Cromer factory up in Ironwood, Michigan. Um, they make those hats that look like baseball caps, but they have this extra panel that can flip down and deploy on the back side of the head to keep the hat from blowing off. And I think it was originally for a guy who worked on a train many years ago, if I remember correctly, I mean like a hundred years ago, and his hat kept flying off. So either he or his wife made this extra little flap that could kind of go down and give a little extra grip on the back of the head so it wouldn't blow off. Um, I think our own Walt Smith might have had a Stormy Cromer hat at some time. So some of you have perhaps seen these, and they got the little tie in the back where those two flaps flaps tie together and it's kind of adjustable in that way but we took that factory tour up in Ironwood Michigan if you get on highway 51 here in Madison and just take it till it ends you'll pretty much be at Ironwood Michigan you'll be right next door in Hurley and uh, where 51 ends and the fun begins but anyway neat factory tour and um, so they adapted to the market and that factory has now taken on the job also of making some huge boat covers like anything big and canvas um, they make the awnings that go over the play sets out in the backyard, so awnings, any kind of big, big uh, tent type thing. Uh, during COVID, they transitioned to making masks and other protective gear for some of the hospitals and the first responders up there. But it was just fascinating to take that tour and to walk out on the factory floor and to just see all of those cutting machines and sewing machines, all of the, the things being done, uh, just buzzing away, just people all over the place running around and uh, working on various projects. And I know they didn't have sewing machines out there in the wilderness, but just a similar picture comes to my mind. With everybody now working together, the Israelite people, getting things done, getting things ready to build the tabernacle. And certainly there would have been a lot of cooperation, a lot of communication involved. And I can't help but think about the Lord's Church. All of us today, we have our own skills and abilities, don't we? But we're called upon to use those talents for the Lord somehow. We are to work together to reach out to the world with God's message. All of us have a role to play, maybe simple, maybe more complex, may involve some skill you've learned before, maybe involving learning something new. Uh, but that's what comes to my mind tonight. The church is described as a building. As God's temple, we play a role in building it. We are the stones in that temple, and we play a role in, in getting it going, keeping it, keeping it uh, going. So this brings us to the end of our study tonight in Exodus 35. Thank you for joining us tonight. Again, if you have any questions, any comments about class, if there's some way we can help, something we need to be praying about, if there's something we can do to encourage you, if you're far away and maybe don't have a church you're connected to where you are, let us know. Um, send me a message, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also send a text or give me a call, 608-224-0274. And we'd love to hear from you, and we'd appreciate it if you could pray for the church here in Madison as well. As we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are a God who builds. You are a God who creates. You create and you make. Thank you, Father, for making us like you, for giving us creative minds that love to be challenged by a project. Thank you for making us a part of your church, your family, where we can build each other up and where we can serve with our hands and our feet and using the skills that you've given to us. Bless us, Father, with sound minds and strong bodies so that we can continue our work for you and your kingdom here on this earth. Thank you, Father, for loving us, and thank you especially for Jesus. We come to you tonight in his name. Amen.